hi and welcome back to the channel we're doing science fiction again this time because science fiction rates on this channel it rates much better than a wardrobe malfunction from a young Ava Gardner so I've got two 1950s science fiction movies for you and they're classy they're the kind of top draw 1950s science fiction movies they're not your usual scumbag tin can rocket ship rubbish they are from major studios they both did extremely well. One's much, much, much better than the other, even though they were both directed by the same director and the same incredibly talented producer. Well, the first one is the first movie ever released by ViaVision's imprint label, a Blu-ray label that I am very, very fond of. And it is based on H.G. Wells' novel, War of the Worlds, the 1953 War of the Worlds, Produced by George Powell, directed by Byron Haskins, starring Gene Barry and Robinson and Les Tremaine. So I'm going to do that one first, and later on, so you stick around for the rest of the video, we're doing one of the most recent releases by Imprint. In fact, it's 112th in their listings, and it's another George Powell, Byron Haskins joint. Conquest of Space, which stars Walter Brook, Eric Fleming, and Phil Foster. And this one was very influential on a 1960s movie that kind of changed the game as far as science fiction special effects are concerned. In 1950, George Powell had great success with Destination Moon. And so in 1953, he thought he'd tackle the big guy. He thought he'd have a go with a classic science fiction writer and update War of the Worlds from Victorian England to modern day 1950s Los Angeles and I think it's an honest adaptation in some ways there are there are things that are left out of the novel things like the alien plants that start growing all over the landscape those things would have been difficult to do in the circumstances but they still keep the core of the story but they kept the deus ex machina ending which in a modern context is kind of funny let's get started with it This could be the beginning of the end for the human race. For what men first thought were meteors are the often ridiculed flying saucers. Clayton Forrester, played by Gene Barry as a scientist, is on a fishing trip up in the California mountains and is brought in by a local town when a meteor of unusual qualities lands in the neighborhood. Of course, Clayton Forrester is a name that people know more these days from Mystery Science Theatre 3000, but it's kind of funny to see it in the original context. He meets a cute local woman, played by Anne Robinson, and her uncle, who is the local pastor. The locals start crowding around this unusual media, which seems to be hollow because it, it didn't land like a solid piece of metal. And then things start going wrong. The top of the thing unscrews like a jam jar, and a questing kind of cobra-like head starts emerging from the machine. It instantly vaporizes three yokels, and later on it vaporizes the uncle who thinks that holding up a Bible is going to stop a heat ray. I'm sure there are YouTube videos proving that that doesn't happen, but I always thought he was bloody stupid for doing that because it doesn't matter who you think's on your side, you've got to learn how to duck in the right times. I found out some remarkable things about this movie, apart from the fact that it still works and seeing it for the first time on a 4K screen with a 2K Blu-ray, I noticed some of the details that weren't really obvious when I was watching it back in the days of VHS and DVD. But 70% but of the $2 million budget of this movie was spent on the special effects. They really front-loaded it with the spectacle and then kind of backloaded it with the sets, the props, the actors, the lights, and all the other bits of business. And I kind of like that. If you're going to tell a story like this, and tell it in a way that hadn't previously been done. This is the first big alien invasion movie that's done in a modern kind of mid 20th century context. You need to put the bucks in for that kind of thing. And Byron Haskin and George Powell did that. The special effects are spectacular. The iconic shape of the Martian war machines has taken over from the stilt walking originals from the original novel in a really interesting way. And it's just, uh, and it's an amazing piece of design. 
It's the design that holds up now. If you look at it now, you go, yeah, that's an alien war machine. It follows up on the guiding principle of the Martians in this movie, which is they base everything on threes. Three war machines in an attack formation. Three section eyes they have. The three section eyes they have on their probes. The very shape of their spaceships with those three lobes, two at the front and one at the back, follows that design principle. The people who did this really took care with things. And when you look at the movie in uh, the 2K version, you can see those waves of magnetic energy coming down like a tripod from the bottom of the war machines and kind of electrocuting the ground. They're there as well, and it looks fantastic in the 2K version on a 4K screen. I was really impressed with how well many of the special effects of this hold up, even when the Martian machines are crashing into the Earth, the lines between the people in the foreground and the machines and the special effects in the background are invisible. They hold up so well in high definition that I'm crazily impressed with it. It shows the beginnings of Hollywood cinema taking science fiction special effects seriously. And I love the movie for that. The love story between Forrester and the young woman played by Anne Robinson is kind of a little bit prosaic. But then when the machines actually attack Los Angeles and you get the apocalyptic scenes of people rioting and trying to jump onto trucks to escape and offering money and jewels to people to let them on board and beating each other up and acting like total bastards all the way through it, that really lands well. It's, uh, it's an important part of the movie and it kind of challenges the American idea of, of American exceptionalism that was very much a part of 1950s cinema. Here's an America that's getting its ass kicked by an implacable foe, and the movies show that. Now, one of the reasons for this, and one of the reasons why it probably lands so hard, is George Powell, being a Hungarian emigre, who had kind of seen what an invading force can do to a country, so he had that visceral knowledge of it. That really plays well. It shows the people rioting and and getting really scared and attacking each other and getting very bestial, which was the kind of dominant paradigm about refugees in the 1950s. But we learned from more recently that refugees and, and people fleeing a country, there's a lot more kindness and a lot more kind of compassion and charity shown in refugees escaping an invading force. I mean, Ukraine shows that. There's a whole bunch of stuff from Syria 10 years ago, which shows that. So when you see people rioting and, and acting like total assholes, that's not really accurate. I think that people are better than we expect them to be. We've had some catastrophic floods that have wiped out towns in New South Wales here in Australia. And people didn't work against each other. They worked with each other. They worked to save one another and to save their civilization. And I think it's important to mention that whenever you see these kind of catastrophic things happening in a movie, that people are better than we expect them to be. I like the design of the Martians too. I think that they're creepy looking. And particularly with the hand articulation you've got for those sucker-tipped three-fingered hands with the aliens. I think that works well. Those hands look like they could make tools. And I think that's very important as well. We don't see the legs of the monsters because it was a little hard to do that accurately at the time. But I think that George Powell and Byron Haskins show us just enough to make believable invaders. There's a square dance in the town just as the meteors are falling. And square dancing was a racist thing created to stop white people from listening to black music in America in the 19th and 20th centuries. So... Um, Watching a square dance in any kind of Hollywood movie, I'm always aware of that backstory. Uh, it's not the fault of the filmmakers, but it's an interesting side, kind of side note to that as well. I also like the start of the film. I like that voiceover by Cedric Hardwick using some of the original text from H.G. Wells' novel. I think that that re works really well. And they give you a tour of the solar system as it was known at the time, which was really interesting. I, I really liked that part of the movie. The ending I don't like so much. One of the problems is that things are going west and Clayton Forrester's got to find his new love and realises that she's going to take sanctuary in churches, so he runs from church to church. And there's that pious voiceover about you know, God's creatures and the most 
humble of God's creatures to feed in the Martians and all that kind of thing. H.G. Wells was an atheist. And I think it does a disservice to the original intellectual property. Wells would have kicked them in the nuts if he had been alive at the time. And I've got a real problem with that because it wasn't necessary. It's not even part of the story. It's just a sop to middle America and sop to the religion of a certain number of Americans. And that's the one bit of the movie that doesn't play well to me as a modern moviegoer. It's a shame and I wish that it wasn't there. I wish I could do an edit where the voiceover was different. But when you start doing that, it's a slippery slope to all sorts of problems. But leaving that aside, The War of the Worlds is a great, honest science fiction movie made by a producer who took the genre seriously and a director who was really good at doing exactly what George Bell told him to. And even though it was in Academy ratio rather than widescreen, which hadn't quite hit most of the major productions and movie studios at the time, the Technicolor is beautifully saturated. The progression from kind of complacent American bucolic countryside to an apocalyptic ending in a city was nicely transitioned. I think the arc of the story from that to that works really well. And I think that George Pallet and Byron Hass can carry us through really interestingly. And it's one of those iconic science fiction films that if you saw it at a certain age, you love it. The imprint Blu-ray of this, by the way, um, you might still be able to find it. They do limited runs of about 2000, but you, if you're smart, you'll be able to find it. This one had um, commentary by Kim Newman and Barry Forshaw, which I always like because it's like listening to two movie buff friends talk about things. There's an audio commentary by Gene Barry and Ann Robinson, which might have been recorded about a decade or two ago. Audio commentary by Joe Dante, Bob Burns and Bill Warren, which is great. The Sky is Falling, making the War of the Worlds documentary. H.G. Wells, the father of science fiction featurette. The Mercury Theatre of the Air presents the War of the Worlds radio broadcast. That's the Orson Welles 1936 one that scared everybody. Theatrical trailer and photo gallery. This is a great package of a great science fiction film. And listening to the Orson Welles one is, is always great value as well. There was a movie called The Night That Panicked America or something like that with Paul Shinar playing Orson Welles and it. it was a TV movie in the 1970s where they showed how they did some of the audio effects for the Awesome Worlds one, like opening jars in toilet bowls to get an echoey, scratchy sound of a jar, of a of an alien spaceship opening. That TV movie needs to get a decent Blu-ray release as well, because I really like it. But yeah, revisiting this was a real joy. And if you haven't seen it for a while, you probably should. And if you have seen it recently, watch it again. So that's the first of the two. The second of the two is the one that influenced Stanley Kubrick when he was thinking of making 2001 Space Odyssey. I've got my problems with 2001 as well. I don't like the plot, which is basically go to the moon, go to Jupiter, meet an alien something, and come back to Earth a giant space baby. Never liked that part of it. And I didn't, I always objected to Kubrick making space travel dull. But anyway, he was very influenced by this movie. Conquest of Space. Now, I'll tell you what's on the extras before I talk about the movie. Uh, HD transfer by Paramount Pictures. Audio commentary by George Pell, author and historian Justin Humphreys. Audio commentary by Barry Forshaw and Kim Newman again. A fellow journeyman, Byron Haskin at Paramount, a featurette made this year. 2022, by the way. The Conquest of Space from the Book to the Screen feature it with NASA illustrator Vincent DeFate, who is a great space illustrator. And that's from 2022 as well. So they really went to town to make sure the extras were worth it on this one. You can still get this one fairly easily. So please, if you're interested, definitely find a copy of this. Uh, the movie was based on a picture book by Willie Lay and Chesley Bonestell, who was the wonderful space illustrator of the middle of the 20th century. And then the four Hollywood screenwriters stuffed it up. The special effects, again, are on point for the 1950s. You've got the giant space wheel and a big winged spaceship that's been constructed on the giant space wheel. 
It's all the brainchild of General Samuel Merritt, played by Walter Brook, who has created the space wheel, who has designed the spaceship, which at first they're saying is going to the moon, but then they change their minds at the last minute to go to Mars. His son, played by Eric Fleming, is on board, and his father treats him like a piece of crap. He was married for three months, and his father demanded that he come up onto the space wheel, and he's left him there without leave to see his wife for a year. The guy is not the sort of person you want running a sandwich shop, let alone a space program. The construction crew they've got for the spaceship is international and has a Japanese guy played by Benson Fong who was actually Chinese-American because that's the way they did things in Hollywood in the 1950s. And he has an embarrassing speech about post-war Japan, which I won't enter into because it just annoys the hell out of me. You've got the comic relief working class guy, a guy called Jackie Siegel, played by the wonderful Phil Foster, who basically is like a working class jerk who somehow ends up on a space station because he's got this savant knowledge of electronics. And he's there for comic relief, but I I like him. I mean, he humanises the very stiff crew and cast that we have in this movie. Eric Fleming's very stiff in it. Walter Brook plays a character who, as the movie goes on, you hate him more and more. You've also got uh, a guy called Foro, played by Ross Martin from the Wild Wild West in his first feature film role. And General Merritt is really a nasty piece of work when one of the guys is dumped from the program because he froze up while doing construction work in a spacesuit. The way that General Merritt tells him he's washed up from the space program is demeaning, disgusting, and nasty. I hate it. I hate this guy even more. They flip the plans at the last minute and say, this spaceship isn't going to the moon, which we haven't been to yet. It's going to Mars instead because they need to get more resources for the human race. Now, whether they're going to kind of export pumpkins from Mars to Earth, I don't know. But that's what they're saying. Nobody twigged, apart from Jackie Siegel, that there was something off with the spaceship because it had wings and there's no atmosphere on the moon. Doesn't take Carl Sagan to figure that out. So the spaceship leaves Earth orbit and starts traveling towards Mars. And increasingly, as they travel closer to Mars and one of the crew is lost, the general starts reading his Bible and turns into an apocalyptic religious nut because apparently he's got space fatigue also known as Hillsong-itis. So the spaceship tries, you know, the spaceship starts to land on Mars. He sabotages the landing and nearly kills everybody on board because he doesn't think humans should be on other planets because something he found in the Bible kind of justifies that. They eventually land successfully, no thanks to him, and nobody ties him up or puts him in a locker or in any way restrains him particularly because he is the other commanding officer's daddy. And of course... For a second time, he almost sabotages them and almost kills everybody by releasing their water supply into the Martian soil. When he does it, there's a struggle for a pistol and his son shoots him. Had it been me, I would have shot him after the first time, but, you know, I've got issues with my father. But (laughs) this moment the general's out of the way, things go along much better. They get an interesting way of replenishing the water supply if they find out the plants are viable on the Martian surface. So there is a possibility of colonization there. And just as a whole bunch of Mars quakes, the guys manage to launch a spaceship and everyone lives happily ever after, except for the general who ends up being the first dead person on Mars. You also get the general's aide, a sergeant called Mahoney, played by Mickey Shaughnessy, who seems to have been transferred in from a World War II movie. But that's okay. People didn't know what kind of hierarchical structure there would be in any kind of space program. They didn't rethink it. They took previous templates, which would have been World War II, to show that, which is why you get the general as an authoritarian. You get his son following orders. You get Sergeant Mahoney acting like a drill sergeant. And you get the slightly insubordinate Jackie Siegel acting as comic relief, but also kind of being the audience's voice in this movie. When there's a dumb order, he will say there's a dumb order, and we go, yeah. 
There's a very funny piece as well where uh, he gets to see his girlfriend on a widescreen television, an enormous 180 inch widescreen television. And that's kind of funny. And the guys get to watch Rosemary Clooney in Here Come the Girls as a part of the entertainment on the space station. I've got no problem with that at all. I, you know, more Rosemary Clooney should have been in this movie because I like her in it. Um, by the way, I did look it up. The movie that it came from, Here Come the Girls, was a Bob Hope comedy, which hasn't had a Blu-ray release. And apparently it wasn't great, but there were some good production numbers in it, including the one with Rosemary Clooney in a harem costume. The problems I've got with this film are the, the stupidities, yeah. Building a spaceship with wings and thinking it's going to the moon. Not doing any kind of psychological testing on the guy in charge of the moon mission. Yeah, those kind of basic things that you'd expect to happen in any endeavour like this just simply didn't happen because they wanted to have some human dramatic tension during the, the trip to Mars. And I think there were better ways to do that. This had four screenwriters. And I think they just threw ideas into a hat and pulled them out at random. This is nearly as dumb as the Martians in the War of the Worlds being anti-vaxxers. I mean, this is influential. The special effects were state-of-the-art at the time. The ideas from the original drawings of Chesley Bonestell and the original text by Willie Lay are great. The idea of using centrifugal force as artificial gravity all of that kind of stuff really works well. We understand it a lot better than the people did at the time. But Conquest of Space, I think, is an important film from that technical aspect, whereas it stuffs up almost everything about any of the human beings in the film. It's a weird one from that point of view. They got so much of the visuals right and so much of the people stuff wrong. Nonetheless, I'm glad I got it. I think it's a worthy uh, part of your collection if you're going to avoid all of the idiocies and the things that make you cringe about it. And I'm, I am, unfortunately, I am one of those people who does tear apart science fiction movies and go, no, that wouldn't happen, or that's wrong, or that person should have been shoved out of an airlock really fast. All of those things cheese me off because I'm that kind of pedant. But the two movies, War of the Worlds, Conquest of Space, I'm really glad that they were put out by imprint i'm glad it's an australian company putting it out as well which makes it a little bit cheaper for me kino lobra releases here are incredibly expensive because of the postage and exchange rates but these ones they, they turn up for about 30 dollars each six movies a month from imprint don't always like all of them but i really like some of them each month that's it for this time around so thank you very much for watching if you enjoy the video please like subscribe leave a comment and hit the notification bell you can also support my addiction to imprint Blu-rays by donating to the channel at patreon.com slash paleocinema. And look after yourselves. Watch some good movies, watch some bad movies. Watch some classic science fiction movies, even though they're flawed like the rest of us. And I'll catch you next time.